Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 26th of December, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So I hope you all had a great holiday period. I mean, I guess it's still the holiday period, right? You've had a great Christmas. Looking forward to New Year's. I don't know if you guys do Boxing Day wherever you are in the world. We do that in Australia. It's kind of like a, a sales event, but it's not really that great. It's kind of disappointing. Just another excuse to have, I guess, like people around and to have parties and stuff. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> who, do, who isn't a fan of that? But uh, apologies for missing Friday's refuel. I had uh, Christmas Eve dinner at my place, so I was setting up for that and I ran out of time to record a refuel but back into it today and covering the last three days worth of updates so we're going to start with a tweet from Superfizz who highlighted that uh, Christmas Day was actually 100 days since the Ethereum merge and he says yeah 100 days ago the Ethereum network became a positive contributor to global health by turning off energy intensive mining we didn't have to do this we could have stuck our heads in the sand and created narratives to justify ourselves but instead we just did the right thing so obviously taking shots at uh, Bitcoin is there but I think, you know, 100 days since the merge, it's kind of gone by pretty quick at this point. Like the merge was in September, obviously, uh, and it's been 100 days since then. But the network has just kept chugging. Like there hasn't been any issues at all. I've, I've personally continued to spin up more ETH validators. Uh, and there's been a lot of people that have been spinning up validators. They're kind of trickling in over time uh, and we have uh, withdrawals on the horizon and yeah it just seems like a very bright future ahead for ethereum post merge yeah, as i've been talking about obviously over the past few months i mean since the merge right um but i think the biggest thing about the merge for me is still the fact that it was just such a big event but not really you know what i mean like it was a huge event a huge monumental achievement for ethereum but the network itself just kept doing what it was doing like users didn't end users didn't feel any different um uh, the stakers obviously did because they were getting execution layer rewards but other than that the network just kept chugging which i i mean i know it might be uh, i might sound like a broken record because i say that a lot but i think it's still worth uh i guess uh reminding ourselves of just how amazing the merge went uh and just how amazing the entire core development and research uh, team is to get us to that point there but uh but yeah anyway as i mentioned uh withdrawals so there's a couple of updates here about withdrawals so you've got marek here from nethermind uh putting out a tweet saying last shanghai news before christmas from the nethermind team so this was put out on the 24th of december withdrawals hive test results there is no room for mistakes when uh, Mario, who's another, uh, it, when Mario is writing tests, I think, I don't know if Mario is part of Nethermind, but he does uh, testing uh, at the Ethereum Foundation here. Uh, and you can see here all the 24 tests that they have for withdrawals have been passed. Now, for those of you who don't know what this means, it's basically a series of tests uh, on on code, uh, on, on code that I guess... Um, for in this case for withdrawals that uh, should be passed in order to have relative certainty that withdrawals are working the way you want them to be working. And these are tests built for Nethermind itself, not for the other execution layer clients, but it usually translates quite well there. Um, but yeah, that's that's really great to see. And then we also had another update here from uh, Gijinda Singh who said, uh, syncing EIP 4844 blobs on DevNet 3 with Lodestar and Geth. So a lot of stuff happening on the Ethereum core development front, of course. Withdrawals, I mean, you know, I've been saying March, April, given how much work has been put into withdrawals already, given how the tests are passing, we will probably have a test net, you know, spun up in January. We'll probably do the hard forks on the test nets in February. March, I, 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 I put my money on March at this point, right? Like, I feel like late March, definitely, uh, if not push it into early April, but it seems like it's just ready to go and it's just coordinating it, just getting all the, um, all the validators and nodes to upgrade, uh, sorry, all the nodes to, to upgrade, uh, to support it, which is now, this will be our first hard fork in a proof of stake world as well, but stakers are usually pretty good with updating here. Uh, but yeah, and then we'll have withdrawals and then we'll finally complete that loop that I've been talking about uh, with Ethereum proof of stake. And I've been talking about that great reshuffling events. I, I really can't wait for, for to see what that kind of, um, what happens there because we have no precedent to go on for this. Like Ethereum is the only network that has gone from proof of work to proof of stake. And it's the only network that has had a period of time where withdrawals haven't been enabled, right? Even for all the way from December 1st, 2020, when the beacon chain first went live, that's how long withdrawals haven't been enabled for. And it's just a very unique situation that Ethereum finds itself in. Now, I did say on the episode of Rocket uh, Fuel, or I guess um, the rock, uh, the um, the guest series that Whack Whack Attack does on his uh, Rocket Fuel channel, I did say last week, or we, we both talked about this great reshuffling event. And really, 
it's not just going to happen, right? Like, it's not like the withdrawals are going to be enabled and all of a sudden all this ETH is going to get reshuffled around and we're going to have a much better and more decentralized beacon chain because of it. I think it is really going to take a push from the community to get to make people aware that, hey, you know, withdrawals are enabled now. So if you have 16 ETH, go set up a rocket pool mini pool. If you have 32 ETH, why not try solo staking? And we have to not just encourage people to do it, but we have to help them with that as well. We need to make sure that our guides are up to snuff, which I think they are. As someone who's gone through a lot of the guides recently, they're, they're pretty good. And obviously they could be more noob friendly, but there, there is a kind of balance there because if you're trying to be like a fully self-sovereign solo staker, do it all from scratch, you know, not, not by a, a a DAP node or anything like that, or not install DAP node, literally do it from a, a fresh kind of Ubuntu box like I did, it's not going to be, uh, I guess, like totally noob friendly. If you follow the guides, you can definitely get it done. You just have to copy paste things and you might run into some issues here and there, but there are communities to help you with that, like ETH Staker. But it's not, and, and obviously on, on Rockapool side, there's a Rockapool community um, that helps you out, but it's not going to be like, I, I mean, people think it's going to be like one click. And the one click staking that we have is centralized exchanges, right? Or buying an LSD such as RETH or STETH. I don't know if we're ever going to get to a point just inherently to that point of like one click solo staking simply because it's it's an involved process. You need to make sure that you have a, a consensus layer, an execution layer, node live. You need to make sure that you've backed up your seed phrase and, and your password that you've used for your validator keys. You need to make sure your validator keys are stored in the right place and all this sort of stuff. Like the, a lot of it can be automated. Dapno does a good job of this. And so does the rocket pool, uh, I guess, smart node stack. But there are still things you have to be aware of. You have to monitor for, you have to wait for, like rather than I guess like buying an LSD token, you don't have to do anything. You literally just have to buy the token and that's it, right? And then taking on a centralized exchange, they handle the infrastructure for you. So th it, there's not going to be a world where solo staking or even staking with Rocket Pool is going to get to a point. Uh, besides buying the LSD, I meant like spinning up a mini pool is going to get to the point that it's as easy as a centralized exchange. But in saying that, it's still going to be. Uh, it's still going to be quite easy. Uh, still, sorry, still very easy today, and it's going to get easier over time. So we do have to push people towards these sorts of things. And in February, uh, as long as everything goes well with uh, all the, I think it's it's being audited right now. But that LEB upgrade that's coming to Rocket Pool will allow people to stake with eight ETH instead of sixteen ETH. Spin up mini pools, sorry, I should say with eight ETH instead of sixteen ETH, and then hopefully four ETH. We can keep getting that down. And then if we get solo staking uh, down from thirty two ETH to something else, which is probably going to take quite a while, I'll be honest. Like it's not going to happen anytime soon. But that's going to help in the future too. But generally, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I might have uh, maybe when I was talking about the great reshuffling, set this expectation that all of a sudden, you know, all the stakes just going to move itself around. No, it's not going to happen like that. There will be some of that, of course. Uh, there'll be people who stake decentralized exchanges that now have the necessary stake to go with Rocker Pool or solo staking. But on, for, I think for the most part, we're going to need to just make a lot of noise about it. And we've proven before that we can make a lot of noise about something and affect real network-wide change, like with the client diversity thing that we did last year that, uh, not last year, sorry, earlier this year that Superfizz led the charge for, uh, we've proven that we can do this and we can do that across the entire network, not just solo stakers, but also centralized exchanges and LSDs and all that stuff there. And we've also proven that we can do it on the MEV well, uh, MEV boost side as well, where we've, we've really kind of uh, made sure that we've got a bunch of ways to resist censorship and, and basically make it so that we can have new relays spun up that are non-censoring and all that sort of stuff there. So that as, as I've said like plenty of times on the refuel, that social layer that Ethereum has is incredibly powerful and there are certain things that we should use it for and and, and, and use it for at its, at its fullest. And this is one of them. Like soon as withdrawals are approaching and coming around, I would love to see the community come together, band together and make a massive drive, an awareness drive for people to spin up mini pools as part of Rocket Pool, you know, spin up solo staking validators if they can. If they have the necessary uh, necessary um, ETH for it because that's really the biggest barrier to entry, right? Uh, and making sure that we see that great reshuffling. But not only that, because with Lido, as I've explained before, they have around thirty percent network share. The only way their network share goes down is if the if other network if other network participant share goes up right now because there's no withdrawals. But once that closes, I would love to see people withdrawing from Lido and getting that down to you know as mu as much as we can because we don't want any one operator having that much. ETH staked. And this goes for people who maybe these people uh, don't have, you know, maybe they only have a few ETH, maybe two, three ETH or something like that. Still withdrawing from, from Lido and going with someone else it would be would be worth it, right? And if you have a thousand people doing that, it starts adding up. So we're going to have to see uh, how that all shakes out. But yeah, definitely don't expect it all to happen on its own. We're going to need as to, to push it as a community, I believe. 
All right, so TrendFanApps here shared a new Ethereum repo that dropped over the weekend, which is basically a nice little explanation of the evolution of the Ethereum proof of stake consensus protocol over time. So I've talked about this a bit on the refill before about where I guess like Ethereum proof of stake came from, uh, you know, the work that was scrapped to basically create the beacon chain uh, and, and basically uh, get to where we are today with the beacon chain being live. And uh, obviously it's going to keep evolving into the future as well with things like SSLE and a bunch of other upgrades coming to it uh, in the future, but you should definitely give this a read. I mean, it does get quite technical and there are equations and stuff in here, but it does have a, a bunch of uh, really nice history behind it too that shows like where we kind of came from and, and how the how it evolved over time. And it's written here by Luca Zanolini, who I believe works at the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, yes, he's a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. I think I've, I've talked about him before, but I just wanted to highlight this for you guys. Go give it a read. As I said, it is technical. There are equations in here, but still worth it. Even if you just skim over the equations and the um, and the technical aspects of it, there is some meat in here for you to get uh, some knowledge out of. So definitely go give that one a check out. All right, so Sam Richards here from the Ethereum.org uh, uh, team put out a tweet over the weekend where he said, my proudest Ethereum.org statistic, over the past year, non-English page views have doubled from 14% to 28% of total page views. Thank you to the 2000, uh, over 2,000 translators who helped translate Ethereum.org in 2022. In case you missed it, the site is available in 51 languages. I've talked about this before on the refuel about how Ethereum.org is really committed to making sure that the website is translated into as many languages as possible. Now, obviously translating it is one thing, but getting people to to uh, come to the website and understand that they can view the website natively in their own language is another thing. And to, th to see here that non-English page views have doubled from 14% to 28% is amazing. Imagine if we get to 50%, right? Over 50% or, or, or more, first, so 50% or more of the total page views are in different languages other than English. Because I've said it before and I'll say it again, Ethereum is a global network. It's not just a network that appeals to English speaking uh, 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 kind of countries or areas such as obviously the US, but a lot of parts of Europe and um, uh, South America as well, and, and and where I am in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but there are plenty of other places with billions of people in them that do not speak English or English is not their first language, right? You have uh, India, for example, you have China. You have the Middle East. You have uh, a lot of actually a lot of Asia, right? That doesn't that doesn't speak um, Eng English as their first language, and a lot of South America too. Uh, I mean, obviously Canada speaks English. I always forget about Canada. They're like the Snow Americans, right? As they as they're called there, <laughs> uh, or Snow Snow Mexicans. People have called them before, which is funny to me. Uh, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think um, when looking at this and looking at the translation efforts, looking at the fact that the page views have actually gone up with it is really great to see because it means that they're not just translating this for nothing. There are people engaging with it. There are people viewing the Ethereum.org website in languages other than English, which is great for Ethereum's, I guess, claim of being a global network. Because a global network in terms of being distributed uh, technically at a global scale is all well and good, but having people in every country on the planet being able to view the Ethereum.org website uh, in their own native language is a huge uh, achievement, a huge body of work, of course, but a huge achievement and making sure that we can have everyone from around the world participate in Ethereum and not just uh, English-speaking countries. And I've always been a big proponent of this. I wish more of the DeFi front ends did this or more of the, I guess, general app front ends did this, but translating, especially natively, without just putting it through Google Translate is quite difficult because you know, if you put it through Google Translate, there's always st stuff that kind of messes it up. And if it looks unprofessional, people are less likely to trust it and, and all that stuff there. But I think just having Ethereum, the, the, the Ethereum.org website, which is an absolutely amazing resource, having that translated is very, very important. So a good work of the Ethereum.org team here. Great to see the adoption on this here. Now, speaking of websites, the Geth team has a new website uh, that they've launched over the weekend here, which you can go give a um, go give a look. I'll link it in the YouTube description. I love this website. It really does kind of work with the whole Geth theme, right, of being an Ethereum execution layer client. Uh, it looks really cool. They have a little mascot here. Uh, I just love it, honestly. I, I think it, it is a really nice website, really nicely laid out. There's a dark mode, of course, which looks really awesome, and a light mode here. You have a link to, to downloads, downloading the clients, and documentation, of course, to, to get started here as well. Uh, and yeah, I just thought it was a really, really great website that I wanted to highlight for you guys because... Um, 
I, I, they obviously put a lot of love and work into this website. Uh, and there's guides on how, sorry, they link to guides like on running an Ethereum node as well on the Ethereum.org website. So there's a lot of love being shared here as well. But yeah, you can go check out this website for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so Xerox uh, not going to make it here from the uh, DeFi Llama team uh, put out a tweet uh, yesterday or today saying, by the way, at DeFi Llama, we've built a new tool for risk teams at DeFi protocols. It shows you how much liquidity there is on chain for any token, e.g. showing how much would need to be dumped to drive price down 20%, tw uh, sorry, 10%, 20%, etc. It's currently in beta access. And you can, you can DM zero X not going to make it for access here, but you can see the liquidity chart for uni. So you guys know that there's only a certain amount of liquidity in like AMM pools, right? like on Uniswap, for example, there's only a certain amount of liquidity for each pair. And obviously the more you sell, the more slippage you incur uh, and the less uh, kind of uh, bang for your buck you get. Now you can see here on uni, this is just a, a preview of the, of the uni token. If you were to sell I don't know, $10 million worth of uni, uh, you would probably incur about 18 to 20% of slippage. Then let's go up to $100 million of uni. You're incurring uh, a, what, 90% slippage here. And then uh, over that, if you, if you go uh, much higher than that, it starts getting, uh, you know, starts getting pretty bad. But you can see the curve here get like, it, it's basically a curve that really slopes up really, really quickly after about, what? Uh, well, basically after $10 million, it starts sloping up extremely quickly here. And that's because this is how those those AMM pools work. And Uni V3 changes this as well because there's ranges. But in V2, I think this is aggregating them, but in V2, there wasn't ranges. So the liquidity would just sit as, as deep as it could go uh, based on how much was in there. But with V3, it can be it can vary wildly from token to token, uh, sorry, to token pair to token pair, liquidity pool to liquidity pool because of the fact that there could be a lot of liquidity in one defined range and then outside of it. And I think this chart is actually showing that as well. Um, I don't know if they actually stipulated if this was V2, V3 or a amalgamation of both, um, but probably is like an amalgamation of, of both here or, or a... Or a joining of both, but uh, generally, you know, I, what I like about AMMs and, and things like Uniswap and other AMMs is that they're really good for the long tail of assets, and they're also really good for just small users, right? When like whales, for example, they're gonna have to use centralized exchanges and maybe a mix between centralized exchanges and on-chain liquidity, but at the same time. Like when you get to the $10 million mark, I mean, even on centralized exchanges, scaling in and out of that position, depending on the on the token that you're trying to to buy or sell is going to affect the market to an extent. I mean, you can have resting orders on the order books. Say you, you wanna buy $10 million worth of ETH, you have a resting order on the books to do that, you would probably have to DCA over time anyway. You wouldn't get the same price. You, know, you wouldn't be able to buy $10 million worth of ETH at, at $1,000 probably uh, just on the book because people would see that, the market makers would see that, they'll probably keep putting the price up, chase it up sort of thing, right? Um, but that's why there's stuff like OTC that exists as well, but that tends to play out in the market too. Like, the, the funny thing about like thinking about liquidity and trading and and size uh, positioning on, on different things is that uh, if you're taking a trade, so you want to buy ten million dollars of ETH at a thousand bucks because you think ETH's going to go up, but then what ends up happening is that if you buy it OTC and then the OTC market makers like, well, I'm going to go and try and inch some inch some profit out of this, and maybe the, uh, maybe once they're done, the price dips below, and then you have to exit that position, and you have to worry about it again. It just gets kind of crazy. This is obviously things that just really majority of the time whales have to worry about smaller users and i'm talking users that, i mean this isn't really that small a million dollars or less right on uni doesn't have that much slippage at all uh but if, if you're talking about like between ten thousand and a hundred thousand relatively small kind of trades here and even below that it's really good for those users and that's what i've always loved about amms is that it's really good for that long tail liquidity and really good for the those um those small users and that's why things like Uniswap are so popular with retail investors because a lot of retail investors especially during bull markets they don't actually come with that much money to play around with right they play around with anything from uh tens of of, of dollars to hundreds to thousands there are obviously people that go higher than that but from what i've seen and a lot of the retail investors or first-time investors that i talk to they don't want to put too much in they always want to get their feet wet and if they're doing stuff on chain they're definitely getting their feet wet with like not not very much money here right and, and obviously gas fees can play into this too but it's great to see charts like this i think this is going to be really good for as uh, xerox uh, not going to make it said here for risk teams at the fire protocols so for example if you're a uh, a money market that wants to onboard a token you want to be sure that that token has sufficient liquidity so that when a big position gets liquidated, you're able to actually sell that into the market to make sure that you don't incur any bad debt. And as we've seen before, there is bad debt that can be accrued very quickly depending on the token. 
depending on how much liquidity there is. And the thing is as well is that what what, what makes this this quite quite um quite interesting is that liquidity can be removed within the same block. So if for example there is a big liquidity provider and they see that or added and removed, and they see that uh, there is going to be a uh, big liquidation. Maybe they add the liquidity in there because they want to eat the fees from that, and then they can probably make a fee. So that's and that's why those defined ranges are really powerful as well on V3 for for that. And you can do that all atomically in the same block, which is very very powerful. But anyway, I got on a little bit of a, of a, of a rant there, but great to see this uh, from uh, Zero X. Not going to make it from the DeFi Llama team. I uh, thought it was very cool. All right, so uh, a big thank you here. Uh, just a shout out to the Popathon community for designing a uh, pull up to celebrate me joining the Rockpool O down. Now you could mint these; there was a hundred of them, but unfortunately they're all gone. These are the options that uh, that people were able to choose from, and I, we went with option ten. So you can see option ten, the bottom right here, is uh, my little uh, penguin designed by um, a Crypto Wife uh, that, uh, quite a while ago. My little penguin avatar uh, sitting on top of a rocket, which I thought was very very cute. But yeah. There was only a hundred of them, uh, and the funds uh, were that that were raised by this pop went straight to the Popathon community. So just to support their work here on this. But I thought this is really cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Pope. Poapathon or Popathon, I guess there's different ways of saying it. Uh, they basically create pops for you uh, and and do do it via design contest, and people come together and and design. Uh, uh, pops for different people here uh, and they're really good at it they're really great at coming up with uh, a bunch of designs that you can choose from uh, and they charge I, I don't know if it's a flat fee for things but uh, I think $250 went from this mint to them uh, but you should definitely check them out if you want to get designs for your next pop done so just wanted to give a shout out there now I have a few tweets here about Rockapool uh, that I want to highlight so one is a Nice thread slash uh, long, lengthy blog post from a Jasper talking about our ETH flipping ST ETH. So this is basically Jasper's thesis on Rockapool beating out uh, Lido uh, in terms of an LSD market share. It's quite long. As you can see here, there are uh, eight different sections that you can read through. It is a lengthy read. I haven't gotten around to reading it yet. There is a summary thread that you can read. And in the summary thread's 25 tweets still, but you can give it a read. But uh, Jasper is probably the biggest RPL bull that I know of uh, in terms of just being uh, uh, on there all the time, talking about Rocket Pool, talking about the RPL token, talking about how it can accrue value and, and doing actual hardcore analysis on it, right? I mean, this is a 50-page analysis. So that's why I like highlighting his stuff, which you should definitely go check out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But as I said before, when it comes to the great reshuffling, it is a thing that I believe is going to happen, but we need to kind of will it into existence. And this is one way that it's going to be done. I think the Rocket Pool community is actually going to be quite loud here because they stand to benefit a lot from this. They stand to benefit a lot because they only account for 2.1%-ish of the market share of, of all staking market share right now. So if they can get to the point where they get to like 10%, for example, that is a lot of RPL uh, locked up, right? A lot of RPL collateralized, a lot of RPL demand, just natural demand from people talking about Rocket Pool, Rocket Pool growing as a as an ecosystem, uh, and, and the, the cool thing about Rockapool is that they've already promised as a community to self-limit their stake. I believe it was 17% was the amount that they would limit themselves to so that they wouldn't grow to, uh, you know, build, uh, above 17% there. But like, let's focus on obviously getting to 5%, 10%, and then worry about that later. But they've already committed to that, which I obviously uh, really care about as, a, um, uh, as, as someone who cares about the health of the beacon chain. And honestly, like I don't hate Lido or anything like that. I think Lido is a net positive for Ethereum. That might be a controversial opinion, but I, I still have that opinion. But at 30% of the network, they're not a net positive. I don't believe that. I believe Lido as a service is fine and cool and needed, but I don't think that they should have 30% market share. I don't think anyone should have 30% market share, uh, not even Rockapool, right? So if we can get Lido especially down to 20% or below, that'll be a monumental achievement. I'd love to see that. And I'd love to see a lot of those, that Lido market share going to Rockapool because obviously they that market share wants to be in, in the LSD space, it doesn't it, maybe a lot of it doesn't want to go to solo staking or centralized exchange staking. They want to stay in the uh, on-chain LSD space. Well, go from Lido to Rockapool, like convert over. And I know I've become a bit of a I don't know if I'd call it a, a Rockapool shill lately, but honestly, I I've been so impressed by Rockapool just setting up my mini pools, get being part of the O down, everything like that. I'm not getting paid for any of this. You guys know that all my O down rewards are going to public goods, but. 
I really want to support the team here, the Rocket Pool team and community, because they've been doing this shit for so long. They've created a a, a, a um, service that they didn't have to create. They could have gone the easy path like other LSDs did, but they've stuck to their guns. They've stuck to the, the tenets of decentralization, and now they just need the market share to match that. So I would love to see Rocket Pool grow as much as possible before withdrawals and especially post-withdrawals. Post but Anyway, definitely check out this uh, this research post from Jasper. Will be linked in the YouTube description below. Now, two more tweets about Rocket Pool. <laughs> so, uh, first one here is a quote tweet of uh, of Superfizz highlighting Joe from the Rocket Pool teams. A little setup here. So, Superfizz said uh, Joe is an engineer at Rocket Pool. When his power went out, he ran an extension cord from his Chevy Bolt to his home staking rig. Rig. He's staking on a custom piece of hardware that he calls the Proteus based on the Rock 5B board, probably going to offer to sell them at some point, which he is, and I'll highlight that in a sec, but look at this shit, like, I quote tweeted this, and I said, this is decentralization at its finest, his power went out, and he's like, oh, well, I'm just going to use a battery, and I'm going to be able to use a battery, because I've got a low-powered device as my, uh, that running that runs my validators here, and this is just so awesome, like, honestly, this is, to me, this is decentralization, because it means that even if your power goes off, even if the grid uh, cuts you off, or for whatever reason it goes off, you can uh, keep your validators online. Obviously, you have to have these batteries available. Obviously, you have to have a car that you can hook, hook, hook into and all the relevant equipment and probably the relevant experience. But the fact that you can do this is what's what, what the true meaning of decentralization is, right? The ability to do this. And I've always talked about this, how the ability to do these things is what decentralization means. The ability to run a full node on low-end hardware is decentralization. It doesn't matter. I mean, you don't have to run a full node if you don't want to, but the fact that the ability is always there for you to do so is the meaning of decentralization. The ability of being able to run validator client clients on really low-end hardware is what's what decentralization means. And I, I think that uh, when you really break it down, that 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 should make a lot of sense and it should re re resonate with people. But that's my view on it anyway. And speaking of uh, his little setup here, Joe's little setup here, he is selling these now. So he put out a tweet later on where he said, well, my power's back on, so it's time to share this with the world. After months of heads down development, I'm thrilled to announce that the, the, the Proteus low power Ethereum home staking box is now open for reservations. Now, the wave one reservations have filled out, but he's taking reservations ongoing, so you'll be in wave two or wave three and you'll get yours a bit later. But basically he's building these Rock 5B little staking boxes and selling them to people and making it so that people can just easily get started with staking on either Rocket Pool or I believe Solo Second. I believe you'll have, uh, have have two options here. So yeah, it comes pre-assembled with uh, Debian 11 installed. The Rocket Pool Smart Note stack is already set up. Just configure it with your clients of choice uh, and you're ready to go. So that's very, very cool. Uh, and there's also different options like fan calling or, or uh, sorry, active calling with fan or, or passive calling. This is the, the stuff that we need actually. People creating these boxes for people. I mean, obviously we have something like a, stuff like Avado and there's Nux as well you can buy, but having stuff pre-installed for people and, and ready to go, especially from trusted community members so you can be so you can trust or have relative certainty that there's nothing dodgy going on here uh, is incredibly powerful. So definitely go check this out. There's a video here and there's also the thread that you can check out as well and possibly sign up for a reservation. I already signed up for mine. I'm probably going to be part of Wave 2 at this stage, but I do have a Rock 5B board on order. Now they're out of stock right now actually, because of um, the China supply chain issues. But once I get mine, I'll definitely kind of highlight my process of setting up. I want to put uh, one of my validators on it, actually. So I'll, I'll highlight my process of setting that up for you guys. But definitely go check this out. We'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, finally here, we have an update from L2Beat who said, happy to list ZK Sync 2.0 as after many months of development, they launched on mainnet. The current baby alpha version is for internal tests only, but we believe it's a huge milestone. We're looking forward to the ZK Sync team removing the whitelist restriction. So yeah, ZK Sync 2.0 is now being tracked on the L2B website, which you can go check out. Maybe I can load up the website here just to see what it looks like right now. Yeah, you can see here, ZK Sync is in seventh place with about $54 million worth of TVL. Actually, is that ZK Sync 2.0? Uh, no, ZK Sync 2.0 is down the bottom here. Uh, that, that, that's just normal ZK Sync, but 2.0 doesn't really have any TVL in it right now because, as I said, it is in baby alpha, which means it's not open to the public or anything like that. Um, but they are going to be doing opening that over time. So very cool to see them list on an L2 beat along with a bunch of other L2s here. Of course, uh, you can go check that out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the newsletter. Join the Discord channel 
channel and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.